worthy to be praised. Amen. We're just going to stand and we're going to pray. Good to see you, man. <laughs> praise God. Father, we give you praise. We give you glory. We are grateful for another chance and opportunity to be in your presence. Where the word says to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. So, Father, we are just being obedient to what you have instructed us to do. And we praise you, O God, for life. We praise you for health. We praise you, O God, for a sound mind. We praise you, God. Every time I pray, that will always be on my mouth, Lord Jesus. For we are truly grateful for giving us the opportunity to even serve you, God. That is a privilege in itself. And Lord God, we just thank you tonight that you've allowed us to draw close to your table and so that we can learn from you, we can glean from you. Father, we can even learn from one another. Lord Father, we are assembling ourselves together as again your instructions are and we can sharpen one another in your word and in opportunity, oh God, to sharpen each other in life. Lord God, I pray for all those who are watching tonight. I pray that the anointing of God will go forth tonight. It will change lives. It will change us, oh God. We don't want to be touched. We want to be changed, Lord Jesus, that we can live the way that you have desired for us to live. In Jesus' name we pray that all God's people say amen. 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 Truly, I am glad to be in the house of the Lord. It's incredible um, what the Lord has done and what he is doing. And um, it, it's amazing. Yesterday's um, encounter, and that's exactly what I call it, um, the encounter that we had with God yesterday was absolutely incredible. And, um, and, and the thing about it is, like I told my wife, um, one thing that I know and I understand about the things of God is especially when he talks about we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the words of our testimony. Um, it's very powerful because when you tell your testimony to somebody, it gives them strength and it also builds their faith. And that's the most important thing that we are really looking for in this day and time is for the faith of the believer to be built. Amen. The only way that can happen is when you go through something and then God brings you out and you turn around and you testify mm -hmm. to the fact that God brought you out, that you have the power and the ability to do it. Um, so it's incredible and we give God praise for what he did um, in the service yesterday and um, and I have to reiterate this even as we get going. When you allow God really to just use you and work through you, and we say this all the time, we have to decrease so that he can increase. And when I say that, it's not just a cliche. When I say it's all about God, it really is. It's all about him, no matter what. And um, there's two things I'm going to say before I get into the Bible study um, in its foundation class. Because I think it's worth talking about, it's worth saying, um, especially where we are um, just as a body and as we continue to move forward. Um, so again, as my wife will always say, and I know she's watching, um, as, as she always says, you can, I cannot prove or disprove this. Um, but just this morning, um, there's a lab that is, what is it, two doors down from us? There's a lab, I believe it's two sections down from where we are. And um, when the lab workers got here this morning, they smelled something funny. Um, and they smelt it and knew exactly what it was and ended up calling 911 because there was a big time gas leak that was at the lab. Now they didn't find out till this morning that means more than likely that gas has been going for a while. Now, but you hear what I'm saying? That where were we yesterday? Right here, worshiping and giving God glory. 
lifting up holy hands, praising him, worshiping him. And this is the reason why when God starts giving instruction, you have to obey because what do I always tell you? You don't know what God is protecting us from. Now, anybody that knows about gas knows you could open the door and light the whole thing on fire. That's a bomb. That's basically what it is. You know, you could just open the door, stick your key in the lock, and it sets off a spark, and next thing you know, half the building blows up. But God. That's why I said, Brother Sam, it's not a joke to me. It's, it, this is real. God protects us from dangers seen and unseen. Amen, somebody. So that's what's happening when you're praising, when you're lifting up hands, and, and when God gives an instruction, hey, worship God, because you don't know what's going on right now. You don't know that the angels of God are in camp round about us, guiding us, protecting us, that even when wickedness is lurking close by, the angels of the Lord are always there to protect us. Okay? That's number one. That's just one testimony. God has us. He, he's guiding us. He's protecting us. And then even with uh, Sister DeAsia, again, y'all, I had no idea she had actually texted my wife either Sunday morning and just told her a situation that was going on. And as the service was going on, especially towards the end of the service, when the Lord just said, we need to bless her. This, and I'm telling this is why you just have to obey God. Amen. I had no idea what they had talked about, what she had texted her. My wife actually didn't even know she was in service. She, she didn't even know till after the service when I called her. It's just incredible. As many times as it happens, it still blows my mind that God just says, bless her. We need to bless her. Of course, lo and behold, the testimony... She needed that blessing. God knows exactly what we need and when we need it. And this is what I want to applaud the church for. Because the church, so look at somebody and say, we're a generous church. And God is blessing you to be a blessing. So trust me, you didn't bless her with $50. Are you hearing me, church? See, and there's a reason why I'm saying this, and she won't even mind. There's a reason why I'm saying this, because your generosity will only continue to grow. Amen. The more that you give is the more God can trust you to give even more. Amen. So when she finally texts the number and told my wife, you see, because again, we're not counting this stuff. It's the church gave it, we put it in her hand, the cash app, all, all of that. See, we're integral, went straight to her. She texts my wife later, mind blown. Because of what the church gave to her. It had commas in it. Come on, somebody. See, you need to be proud of this. There, that's why I'm not hiding it. That's why I'm telling you, you need to be proud of this. Because there, we're going somewhere. Thank you. We really are. And you might think, oh man, this is just insignificant. It's just something small. No, no, no. It's very big. Because yes, uh, Pastor Mark Moore, and then I'm going to get into this, but I just have to lay this foundation first um, because it, it's all ties together. Pastor Spirit and Truth in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, the church is probably about maybe less than a year old maybe nine months old, 10 months old, somewhere in there. Um, in that span of time, they, they opened their third location. Okay, just, just stick with me for a second. I'm going somewhere. So it opened their third location, and the building that they just bought, for because they outgrew where they were in Atlanta, so they needed a bigger building, and... Um, there was a pastor at the end of 2023, Sister Sharon, that was getting ready to disband their church. 
the five acres and three buildings and all that. They were getting ready to disband their church as soon as he needed a new place. So they were disbanding, he was needing, and God put them together and he ended up buying it from him. Oh, I'm, I'm going somewhere. Give me two minutes, I'll finish this story. <laughs> but you have to hear this so you understand what God's capable of doing. So then he bought the building, got a hold of the building, they needed $350,000 to totally renovate the building because they want to have the first service Easter Sunday morning. So remember, how long ago did they buy the building? They purchased the building maybe about, I'd say, three weeks ago. When's Easter Sunday morning? So they needed how much? $350,000. Okay. How much do you think they got? I think, yeah, pretty close to like $450,000. You know why? Because Pastor Keon Henderson in Houston sent them, which is a pastor. He pastors in Houston. God spoke to him. He said, God told me to send y'all $14,000. Pastor Mike Todd in Oklahoma, God spoke to him and told him, send them $100,000. Spoke to Pastor Travis Green. You know who Pastor Travis Green is. I think his church is in South Carolina. Spoke to him, told him, send him $10,000. So you see how quickly the number just... And then, of course, several people sent 1000 and 500 and 100 and, and and so on and so forth. And in probably less than three weeks, they raised $450,000 and then full-fledged renovation, Easter Sunday morning, they'll be in the building. The work started the next day after they bought the building. And I'm not borrowing. See, there's a reason that I'm telling the church this. That's why when God starts to do things with us, he starts on levels. He starts building your faith to see what you'll do. So something as simple as what went forth yesterday, give, and because you're obedient in giving, right? And again, it wasn't just $100 that you blessed her with. It's something substantial. So God, that's how he tests us sometimes. Oh, okay, well, they'll, obey, they'll be obedient to this. So then when the next thing comes and you give to that, God, I've said this for years now, in order for God to move the ministry forward, he has to bless you. He has to bless the people. Amen. And he has to put you in a position to where if there is a need, you can send $10,000 and don't even blink. Amen. Oh, there's a need? How much do you need? Oh, 10? Okay, that's all? Let's just send your wiring information. We'll get it to you Monday morning. That's how God wants to use you as a conduit in the kingdom. Okay? So it's kingdom time. It's kingdom time. And this is exactly what the power of God ministries is going to be doing. Amen. I'm telling you, saints of God, this is why we talk the way we talk. You have to put it in the atmosphere. Amen. You have to start saying it. See, I know everybody loves, man, ooh, we love this so much. You know what I'm saying? God, we need a campus. Yeah. That's what my prayer is. My, I'm praying ahead. I'm on it. Hey, we won't be here much longer. See, that's what you have to start saying. You have to put it into the atmosphere. When Pastor Mark Moore was talking about it, they were having church in the school. And he told them, we won't be here much longer. Amen. Three weeks later, bang. See, you have to start speaking in faith. Speak those things that are not as though they are. And watch, they will become it. We're going somewhere, church. I'm telling you, well, can I get one more? And then I, I promise I'll dive into this. Well, I won't name the name of the place because everybody will know. It's a restaurant that, you know, I used to go to. And then I, well, I was going, then I stopped going. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then, <laughs> so uh, just today, I said, you know what? I'm going to go get something. And everywhere else was closed, so I said, I'll just go there, right? Watch how God works. I don't think I've been in there probably like three months, at least three or four months. 
So today, I walk through the door, and as soon as I walk through the door, there's three ladies in there having a conversation about church. So one of them, of course, they know I'm a pastor, so they turn and they say, oh, look, you're come pastor right now. Now, I haven't been there in like four months. Soon as I walk through the door, they're talking about church. Now, hear me. This is why I'm, I'm telling you I'm proud of this church because they're talking about church, and they're talking about you know, certain kind of Christians. And this is why they don't this and they don't that. They don't this and they don't that. So when they started talking to me, they're like, well, what do you think about that, Pastor? So we don't do that at our church. Right? So, of course, two of the ladies perked up. They wanted to hear what I had to say. So, of course, I'm bold. I just started telling them about stuff, telling them how we operate, telling them how we function. And, and of course, the other one, was still trying to talk about, you know, this is why I don't go because, you know, they just think this way and think that way. I said, well, we don't do that at our church. You see that? Now, two of those ladies instantly started asking me, well, what time do you all have service? <laughs> see, and I knew it. I could feel the hook instantly. <laughs> What time do y'all have service? Oh, we have service on Sunday. Sunday at 11 o'clock, you know? And what's the first thing that they ask me? Man, well, you know, what do we need to wear? I said, well, what you have on looks good to me. <laughs> you know? Oh, my God. I've never heard that before when well, you're hearing it now. Come on, church. Because all they had in their mind was bad experiences before. And the cashier, little young girl, probably like 25, she told me, watch, because I told her, see, I'm just, there, I'm just bold to it today. I said, listen, many people run into the wrong kind of Christian. And then they think every Christian is like that. And that's not the case. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. God is going to give you the concepts and he's going to show you what to say, when to say it, that's going to hook somebody. Yes, amen. Okay? And trust me, when they come, I'll, I'll point them out to you. I'll say, there they go, right there. <laughs> Families. Yes. So God has us out there for a reason. There's a lot of folk that have been out there and they've come across the wrong kind of Christian. So that's why well, you know, I'm just not going to do the church thing anymore and all that kind of stuff. And then when they come across you and they realize everybody's not the same, all of a sudden something fires up in them again. Yes, sir, Bishop? Right. Wolf in sheep clothing. That's what they that's what they come in contact with. You know, they think they come into contact with a Christian. Well it's Christian they have a Christian clothes on, but they are wolves. Right. And and, and that's that's what make up mess up everything. So again, be mindful yes. about what the Lord is using you Amen. for. Amen. Your life is not your own. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. And God will send you somewhere, Brother Walker, at the right time. Again, I haven't been in there probably four months. But why did he send me there today? Because there were souls there that needed to hear something from the Lord. So you're just the messenger now. You thought you were just hungry. You thought you were just hungry, but God was actually sending you because there were people that needed Amen. to hear something. Amen? Amen? So God is doing some amazing things, incredible things. All right? So let's get into this. When the light shines. That's why I had to lay that found good foundation. When the light shines. And the focus verse, John chapter 9, verse 39 Jesus said, for judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and they which see might 
be made blind. Mm. Very trivial already. All right? The truth about God, God's miracles reveal his glory. Okay? Again, that's why I had to share those couple of testimonies before I even got into this. Because miracles are for, watch this, y'all. They're really for the unbeliever. See, we really shouldn't be surprised when we see miracles because we believe that God's a miracle-working God. Miracles are for the unbeliever so that when they see that the power of God is real, they come to a position of believing. So the truth for my life, I will submit my life for the glory of God. Your life is not your own. You're going to hear me say that several times tonight. Your life is not yours. When you really submit your life to the glory of God, you say, use me, he will use you. He will put you into the position and you have to open your mouth for his glory. You can't be shy about it. Hmm. Lord have mercy. You can't be shy about it, saints. Yet you have to be bold. You have to stand up for what you believe and let your light shine. All right? So let's go into this. Let's go over to uh, page 242 uh, in the lesson Connection. It says, Irv Amagan is an internationally acclaimed artist whose work have been exhibited in galleries throughout Europe, Asia, and North America. The Turkish-born painter paints landscapes still lives and portraits in bright colors. His mastery of perspective, scale, and light, and the shadowing is stunning, particularly because he was born completely blind. Hmm. So as a child, he noticed people constantly warned him about his surroundings, but they never seemed to warn others. When he asked his parents about it, he learned that others could see what he could not. Okay? So he reached out to his father for help. His father patiently answered his questions and introduced him to objects, shapes, and textures. So once Eustra's father gave him a paper butterfly to help him understand their shape, while holding the model, Eustra drew the shape to test the accuracy of his perception. He began by etching on cardboard to make inventions he could trace out with his fingers. He then practiced drawing lines to represent the butterfly's outline. With practice, he eventually mastered the ability to draw and color butterflies and other objects. Remember, he's blind. And his skill, as his skills developed, Eustress began to paint on canvas. When he heard his paintings appeared flat and unrealistic, he discovered light acts on objects and create shadows and shades of color. Amazingly, he was able to incorporate these features into his art, actu um, accurately recreating what others described. Eustress later learned about scale and perspective and was able to add depth and dimension. Again, he's blind. 1994, he participated in an international exhibit of visually impaired artists. He began to catch the attention of artists and researchers alike. Eventually, he became the subject of scientific studies on human perception. During brain scans conducted while Eastridge drew, researchers observed that his visual cortex illuminated as if he were seeing. Hmm. The experiments proved that vision was a function of perception, regardless of how it is experienced. That's powerful. Simon Hayhoe at the University of Bath observed that Easter's work shows that it is possible for people born blind to understand, describe, and create visual pieces of art. Blind, okay? How a blind artist is challenging our understanding of color. Eastriff has an accurate vision of the world, although he has never seen it with his eyes. 
Seeing is not the same thing as perceiving. See, underline that in your book. Seeing is not the same thing as perceiving. The Lord told the prophet Isaiah to say to, to, to the disobedient Israel, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Jesus applied these words to the unbelief he encountered in his day. You'll find that in Matthew 13, uh, Mark chapter 4. Because their hearts were hard, some people were blind to what could clearly be seen. But others, like Estreth, perceived what they could not see with their eyes. The difference between seeing and perceiving is a matter of faith and of courage. It's so powerful, y'all. Because right here in the lesson connection, the main thing that we have to pull from this is that faith in God is not just connected to your physical sight. This is what mostly gets us into trouble because we are following what we see with our physical eyes. Okay, We look at situations and we're looking at it through our physical eyes and through our senses and we're trying to figure it out that way instead of walking in faith. Sometimes the best way to walk in faith is to close your eyes and get on your knees and start praying. Okay? Because what you're looking at, God is able to fix, heal, take care of, turn around, and what you're perceiving and what you're seeing is two different things. How many of you have ever perceived something from God? Something fell into your spirit, but it was totally different than what you were looking at. Completely different. But yet you knew that God was speaking to you directly. Now you're looking with your physical eyes and you see what's going on. They've told you all the negative. They've told you all the bad reports. They've told you all this, but yet God dropped something into your spirit and you instantly perceive that everything is going to be all right. Amen. See, that's the difference between seeing and perceiving. So what Jesus said, and he said this a couple of times throughout the course of the Gospels, that he would come and he would speak in parables. And when he talked in parables, a lot of times, Bishop, they wouldn't understand what he was saying. And then they would go to Jesus and he would, they would ask him, why do you speak in parables? And what did Jesus say to them many times? <laughs> that seeing they might not see. And then the disciples were just who were like, man, why? Just talk to us straight. Give it to us, man. We don't understand what you're saying, Jesus. He did not want them just to see it with their physical eyes. He wanted them to tap in to what you really perceive in the spirit. Because in the spirit is more real than what you're looking at. This is why we as Christians have to learn how to walk in the spirit. Okay? It's not just a cliche term. Walk in the spirit. Walk in the spirit. No, no, no. You need to walk in the spirit. Because when you walk in the spirit, God starts filling you. He well, literally, what he's doing is he's speaking through the spirit to your cognitive state. It's like that you start to say, Bishop, you start to say this. Don't say it's your mind. If you have the Holy Ghost, it's not your mind. It's God. My mind told me. No. God is putting something in you and speaking it through you. And that is now connecting to your cognitive state. Something that was downloaded in the spirit now triggers in your cognitive function. Why can I say this? What did Jesus say? My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I don't care what you can think, Brother Patrick. I'm 
telling you, whatever comes to your mind, it's still not going to be his thoughts. See? Until you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, and you leave your thoughts behind and take his mind. Once you get his mind, now you're constantly thinking the way Jesus thinks. Oh, I'm going somewhere tonight. Because if you're not thinking the way Jesus thinks, then you'll look at people different. You always know if you have the mind of Christ. How does Christ look at people? How does Christ look at situations? That's how you know you have the mind of Christ or you're still leaning to your own understand. Now, this is, some of you might be looking at me like, mm, Pastor, this, this is more, it's harder than it, it's sounding or it's, you know, how, what's that terminology? It's easier than it sounds. Easier said than done. See, because who in here really saying, I have the mind of Christ? I see Bishop's hand going up. See, I, I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of hesitation. See, seriously, see this, this, this is real talk. Do we really have the mind of Christ? When we look at situations, do we really see it through His eyes? Okay. Oh, coming to you, coming to you. Now, now watch this. I'm going to help you a little bit because remember, Jesus was all man. He was human. And he was God. So watch this, y'all. Remember, if you go to the garden experience, that's probably the greatest story that shows you the human side of him. When he was looking at a situation and in essence was like, mm, let this, if it can pass. See, so don't beat yourself up. I'm trying to help somebody. Don't beat yourself up because there will be times in your life, and if you haven't had any yet, just keep living. Where you'll get pressed to the point to where you'll say, if this cup can pass. But this is where the perception kicks in. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Go ahead, Deacon, then go to Sister Petrina. One thing I found, sir, that, that happened with me mm -hmm. is that there are times when when something would happen and I would a thought would come on my mind and I was like, okay, that's not a godly thought. Right. That's not how you handle it godly. So you check yourself, Kadeem, before you wreck yourself, kind of a thing. Right. And then I, I get myself in line. Mm. So um I'm not there as Bishop is where it's, it's locked in. But yeah. there are times when I, I got a check, you know, I got a checklist my, um, going right. on and it I, it happens. And I'm like, okay, thank you God for that because, yeah. you know, Kadeem could have said something or did something that could have. Yeah. Go ahead, Sister Petrina. I was going to say that we should actually, you know, we should actually be confident to say that we do have the mind of Christ. Right. Because the scripture tells us, but you have the mind of Christ. Like if we have his spirit, if we're filled with his spirit, then we indeed do have it. It's just a matter of us becoming, mm. you know, able to better perceive and, you know, learning how to walk and to tap in and to hear right. and get our natural senses out of the way. So, as missionary said, if you have the Holy Ghost, yes, the then you have the mind of Christ. But you have to submit. Hmm. See, the one thing that God does not take from you is your choice. He does not take your choice from you. He does not take your will from you. You have to submit. You have to lay it down. This is getting deep quick, y'all. Do you know even for Jesus, again, he's our example. He, what did he do with his life? He laid it down. He submitted to death. If not, death could have never taken him. Mm, come on, church. Nothing could have killed him. You have to notice. You have to stand. 
Death couldn't, death had no power over him. Just think about this, and even scientists will prove this, that everything Jesus went through before he got to the cross should have killed him. Any normal person would have already been gone a long time ago with what they did to him. They couldn't even understand how he didn't die. I'm telling you. The Roman soldiers, they were known for that stuff. They were known for how brutal they could be and how quickly they could kill somebody. But yet Jesus just kept going. They couldn't take his life. He's hanging on the cross and he's still speaking out with power and authority and none of them can understand what in the world. Do we have done everything to him. And they couldn't comprehend that they were beating up a body. They were breaking down a body. They were breaking down the shell of him, the outer shell, but they weren't breaking him down. So he kept speaking with power until he says, into your hands. I commit my spirit. And then he gave up. And his head fell and he died. And that's when the centurion said, of assurance, this is truly the son of God. You see how powerful this is? So we have to tap, we have to tap the differences between perception. And just seeing with our physical. And I know we have to train. I tell somebody this. You have to train yourself for this. It's you have to. Say it. You have to train yourself for this. It's just like doing anything. If you want to run a marathon. You don't just get up tomorrow and say I'm going to go run a marathon. You have to train your body for it. If you don't train. You'll pass out. You'll be disorientated. Your legs won't even allow you to go that far. You'll cramp up so fast. You have to train. Many times people train for months, sometimes years, to run those type of marathons. So you have to do what? Train your spirit. Okay? This is why foundation class is important. Bible study is important. Sunday service is important. Why? It is It's training. Go ahead, Bishop. Then we'll go further. Yes, yes, uh, Papa Teacher. Um, I like to. I hope I can help somebody. You have to get to the point where, like I told, I pray the Lord. I say, Lord, I commit myself totally to you, mm -hmm. like a little babe. I, I, when I I can see like myself as a little child, right? The Lord is carrying me. So I say, Lord, if I, if you drop me, then I, if I, if I fall out, you know, I you have to blame you because. I, I commit myself into your hands. That's it. Yeah. I, I, I said, I don't know if I pray the right prayer. When I said it's the right prayer. <laughs> I said, Lord, I said, if, you, if I drop, then you drop me. So I have to blame you because yeah. I totally leave myself. Totally. Yes. Completely. I, I, and that's, I know. I, like I said, I remember this sister that I, I like somebody said, go talk to her finally. And I said, well, she look okay to me. That will see by my heart. Right. And then a few days after that she came to me crying. And I said, Oh my God. Yeah. I, I said from that day I never say in my mind anymore. Obey God. <laughs> yes. Yeah. If God tells you to do something, yes. do it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how, what it looks like. If he tells you to do something, do it. If he tells you to pray, pray. If he tells you to give somebody some money, give it to them. No, oh, it doesn't look like they need it. You don't know what they need, and you just obey God. Go ahead, man. That's what I say real quick. Recognizing God's voice in you. You mm -hmm. know, sometimes we're not sure about, I remember years not sure, is this really God or is this me and what have you. But asking him, help me to hear your voice. Right. And test it out. And what happened is different events happen. Natural stuff. Right. God said, move over in this lane. And I'm like, well, if that's really you, God, that lane will go fast. Well, that's dumb. Just go over there and watch it move fast. But learning and knowing yeah, his training. voice is, is part of that training so then you can have the mind of Christ is there. But how do you access it if you don't know it's him? Right. My sheep know my voice. 
this and another they will not follow. Watch this. 243, Jesus saw a need. John opened his gospel with a reference to the light. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. Now, this is what I want you to do, uh, Sister Tiffany. Connect this to yourself. In him was life. So if in him was life, then what's in you? And the light was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. See, you have to tap into this. Everything that Jesus is, you're a joint heir. You're connected. Okay? When Jesus died, he took you with him. When he rose, he took you with him. Remember, the analogy, you're in him. Anywhere he goes, you go. So when it says he's life, in him was, uh, was life, that means life is in you. If life was in Jesus, life is in you. And the life that he had was for mankind, and the life that you have is also for mankind. He was the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Okay? You couldn't hide Jesus. You can't be hidden either. It is what it is. Stop trying to fit in. Stop trying to fit in. You're never going to fit in. You are the light of the world. As soon as you hit the light switch, all the darkness dispels. You know that light is in the room. Stop trying to fit in. There's too many lights trying to fit into darkness. And it doesn't work. It's not going to work. You are the light. I can see you, Brother Michael. You go to the club today, the sinners are going to see you. Like, man, what you doing in here? <laughs> you ain't supposed to be in here, man. There's something different about you. You don't even fit in. Because you're the light of the world. They already know. They don't, they, man, you need to leave. We can't have fun while you're here. You're, you're messing up the vibe. That's what they're going to tell you. Come on. Where's my real folk? That's what they're going to say. We don't want you around it, man. I, I can't act how I want to act when you're here because something bad might. I, I had somebody tell me that. I can't do this while the pastor's here. I don't want to get in trouble with the Lord. <laughs> it's too late. You're already in trouble with the Lord. Are you, you see that? So light is powerful. It's powerful symbol in biblical imagery. It recalls the power of God's presence to bring life and understanding. And that's what the church is for. The church is to illuminate the life of a person and bring understanding and clarity to what, y'all? To life. Because that's what you're living. You are the church living life. Come on, y'all. Get this. Amen. You're the church living life. You're not life living the church. You're the church living life. So there has to be understanding and illumination that is brought out to warm our spirits and to illuminate our path so we may know the truth and be free from the chains of darkness, ignorance, and sin. John traced the theme of light throughout the entire gospel. It comes into particular um, in uh, John chapter 8, when Jesus stood in the temple and declared publicly, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. That's John chapter 8 verse 12. John chapter 9 reveals precisely what happens when people encounter the light. The story begins with Jesus and his disciples seeing a man who was born blind. Okay? So what happens when somebody encounters the light? Something should be shining into them. Something should trigger on the inside of them because they have come into the presence of real light. You are, again, the light of the world. 
He's not just talking about the flashlight that you turn on and shine it around. He's talking about you lighting up somebody's soul. Yes. This is a soul thing. Yes, to where somebody that's lost in darkness, their soul is illuminated. Yes. And they realize, for some of them for the first time, that there is hope. Yes, amen. See, if you've ever been in a dark place, you might not... See, a lot of times, many of us has not, we haven't been through, you know, <laughs> see, that's why sometimes it's good for you to talk to folk that was strung out on drugs. It's good for you to talk to people who had, were, they were addicted to alcohol, addicted to crack or heroin or something like that, and you see God brought them out. Because they'll tell you how dark it was. So you don't know how dark it is until you're stealing from your grandmama. Oh, see, can we talk? It's pretty dark, huh? When your own child is stealing from your purse and stealing from your wallet to fund their addiction. And no matter what, they get arrested, it doesn't matter. They go to jail, it doesn't matter. Because the addiction, the darkness has literally overtaken them. They can't see nothing else but the darkness. And then Jesus shows up. Wow. Yes, sir. <laughs> see, this is what salvation really is about. This is what the church is really about. Then Jesus shows up. Then point to somebody and say, then you show up. Yes. And the darkness that had them totally encompassed now starts to lose wow. its grip. Yes. Amen. Amen. And the Amen. devil's trying to keep the grip on them, yes. and the yes. grip starts to loosen yes. because they're realizing there is a hope. That's what the light of the world is. Hmm. Oh, so look at this. It says, much like Job's friends. The disciples assumed that sin and suffering were directly connected. So let's deal with this. Is sin and suffering directly connected? No. <laughs> no. In John chapter 9 verse 2, the disciples reasoned that this man was suffering as a penalty of sin. Their only question was whether uh, the sins was his own or his parents'. Jesus rejected their narrow theology. Yes, Something as complex and mysterious as human suffering cannot be explained away with simplistic moralizing. See, this is what we do. Amen. We quickly try and just explain within our own mind and just try and explain stuff away. Oh, this is why it's happening. His mama must have did something. His daddy must have did something. And God's like, that doesn't have anything to do with it. Okay? Nothing to do with it at all. It's not correlated. Okay? So, again, y'all, but why do we do that? Because we are seeing yes, sir. <laughs> with our natural eyes and not in the spirit. Okay? Job had done nothing wrong. Nothing. You know what Job was guilty of? Being righteous. Job was minding his own business and Satan hmm, went into the heavenlies and was having a full-fledged conversation with God while Job was at Starbucks <laughs> drinking his morning coffee on his way to take care of whatever it is he was going to do for the day. And here goes a cosmic conversation. See, again, y'all, you can't see that. It's perceived. And here comes Satan, cosmic conversation. Satan tells God, if you take the hedge away from him, then he'll curse you. God says, all right, I'm going to take it away because I trust Job. So all this stuff that started happening to Job happened because he was righteous. Not because of sin, because of righteousness. So again, that's the difference between perception and seeing. 
And all of his friends were judging him. <laughs> Said to Dawkins, I know you did something. And, mm, I know she, see that's, then you start calling the, the prayer warriors. Come here, Dr. Z, Sister Petrina. We need to pray for Sister Dawkins because I know there's some sin somewhere. She, I know she did something. Because you're just, you're looking, you're trying to find in the natural and you're not perceiving that this has nothing to do with natural things, but it's all spiritual. It's a spiritual attack. See, so for us as the church, we have to be aware of that, that spiritual attack is real. Spiritual onslaught. Sometimes people get just sick out of nowhere. And you're wondering what's going on. Spiritual attack. And you have to be able to perceive this in the spirit, even when you get ready to pray for somebody. Yes, See that? That's why the scripture says, don't lay hands on somebody just real quick. Yeah. You know, yeah. suddenly. Yeah. You have folk like that. Boy, I'm just praying. Woo, I'm just... You better watch it. You better pick up in the spirit what's really going on with that person. I'll never forget this, Brother Walker. I was preaching at a church in Houston one time, and there's this lady. She she was sitting probably about where, where Deacon's sitting right there. And all of a sudden, she started growling and doing all of that. And I swear to you, it's like she hit the ground from where you are right now, and she hit the ground just went and straight up to the altar on the ground okay now I'm sitting here preaching hit the ground I'm, 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 as God's my see this was before Facebook live and all this stuff that we have now came all the way to the front and immediately there were two sisters see this is why you have to be obedient Two sisters jumped up and started speaking in tongues and went to lay hands on her and I said don't touch her just like that. Oh, trust me, they got offended after the sir. They got offended. that's a whole nother story. I said, don't touch her. Oh my God. So of course they stepped back. Oh, who do you think he is? See, I wasn't the pastor, I was just there preaching. You see? Because I picked up, I perceived what was going on. If they would have laid their hands on that lady. There's no telling what would have happened to them. That's right. Instantly I perceive that this is a demonic Demon. force. Yep. And this demon was powerful. Yes. And basically was ready to, to just wreak havoc. I said, do not touch her. She slid all the way up. I said, get up. Just like that. Get up. Get up. She stood up just like this. And by, see, now the pastor came down to stand beside me. I just called for some oil, laid hands on her. That demon left straight out of her. So then, of course, see, I, see this is why I, talk, I tell y'all the truth. Then after the service, it was maybe like a day later, I got a call from the pastor. <laughs> oh, the two ladies, you know, they were offended. You know, and I said, I said, well, I said, if that, if they would have laid hands on that lady, they would have probably got thrown across this church. I said, and it's real, it's concerning to me that you don't understand that. See, this, this is not a game, y'all. Living for God and moving in the spirit, it's not a game. That's why even in this church, we have to be prepared. Because the higher we go yeah, yeah. in the spirit, mm -hmm. you have to be prepared Amen. for demonic activity Amen. to start lurking around. Yeah. You know the yeah. And you have to know that's not the Holy Ghost. Right. Yes. Come on, church. Absolutely. Somebody starts shaking. That doesn't mean it's God. Right. You have to be able to perceive that's not God. Come on and be bold enough to call for help, to call for reinforce. Listen, don't lay hands on nobody suddenly. Absolutely. See, oh, why am I going down this road, Dr. Zarita? 
Because the thing about it is, there are ranks in the spirit. Why am I going down this road, Brother Walker? There's ranks in the spirit. And demons know that. That's right. They know that. This bishop is a different rank than you. See, this need to be taught more, you know, Sister Petrina. Bishop's not on the same level as anybody in this church, including me. There's different rankings in the spirit. If he stands in front of somebody, and specifically in front of a demon, it's going to be different. See, this was this was wrong. I'm telling you with a lot of the new age stuff now. Because everybody, oh, I'm this is powerful. I don't need no pastor. I don't need okay, go on. You keep going on with your bad self and see what happens. It's not about tooting your own horn. It's about knowing who you are, the rank and file in the spirit. Just talk to Daniel. Yes, amen. Daniel will explain it to you that when he prayed, what happened? His prayer couldn't get back to him because the demonic forces were they were warring in the heavens. God had to dispatch who? Michael the archangel. Yep, different level. Lord, see, I don't have time to deal with this type of disease. He had to dispatch a high-ranking angel. To come down and tell the other angel, look, y'all stop playing around. Give me the answer. <laughs> this answer needs to get to where it needs to go. So what do you think is going on in your life right now? When you pray, you don't think that principalities and powers are blocking up stuff? When you pray for the healing of somebody, you think they're just so happy. Oh, yes. Oh, God sent the answer for healing. Just let it through. <laughs> God sent the answer for revival. Just let it through. You know that there's a war going on in the heavenlies. And you have to press and believe God that he's taking care of his side. Come on, church. There See, there's something that we can't even see. You just have to perceive it. What did Daniel do? He already knew God got this. So what am I going to do? I'm just going to keep praying. Because I know that God's handling his business. He has never failed me yet. But there is a battle going on. See, don't let it scare you. But no, it's going on. There is a battle going on right now. And many of your prayers are up in the wind. Yes, and you have to pray, God, yeah, give him yeah, yeah. send Michael. Mm -hmm. You know, Michael's still there. Right? He still exists. Yeah, yeah. And the same Michael that brought the answer to Daniel is the same Michael. Uh oh, see it? I might. Yes. Woo! I, see, Woo! I, I, I got it. The same angel, Michael can deliver you a message. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Mm. What would you do if Michael visited you tonight? Mm. Yes, I am Michael, the archangel. Yes. God sent me yes. with a message yes. for you. Yes. <laughs> oh, we go, we getting into some stuff now. If an angel came to Mary, highly favored. She wasn't just talking to herself. She was talking to the angel. And she knew it. She was looking at Gabriel. And he told her, I'm Gabriel. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Ooh, church. Come on, church. You have to know who you are. Yes, amen. You have to don't perceive. Somebody say, I need to perceive that God is with me. with you saints he's with you say it again God is with me he's with me oh my God so look at this hmm, Jesus we're not even going to get too far through this 
So why needs arise? Again, people were assuming sin. We understand it's not, the two are not connected. Okay? So needs arise in part B. Needs arise in life for a variety of reasons. We could spend a lot of energy attempting to answer the question why. Okay? So when something happens, we can ask why all night long. Why, Lord? Why? Why did this happen? Why? Why did I lose my job? Why did this? Why did that? Why did the other? We can do that all night. However, the better question is how? How will God work be revealed in and through this need? How will his glory be displayed? Remember, who are we? The light of the world. How will his glory be displayed? How is his light shining? The how question help us to frame our needs within the context of God's grace and redemption no matter why we have need. Oh my God. Please underline that in your book. No matter why we have the needs, it is the how that is the better question. How is God going to get glory out of this? See, we have to be mature Christians now. If you lose your job, how is God going to get glory? See? How? If you're sick in your body, how is God going to get glory from this? When you come through and you're healed on the other side, that's how he gets glory. He gets glory when miracles take place and the doctors don't know how it happened. He gets glory. He gets glory when drug addicts come off of drugs. He gets glory. He gets glory when an alcoholic sobers up. He gets glory. He gets glory when anything you're addicted to gets broken off of your life. God gets glory. You become the light. Your light shines in the darkness and other people come to Christ. Amen. Your life is not your own. See? But watch. Selfishness has taken over. Hmm, give me like 10 minutes and I'll close. Selfishness has taken over. So I'm not worried about being the light no more. I, I'm not worried about being the light. I, I'm just making sure that my room is lit. <laughs> as long as my room is lit, I'm good. I'm not worried about turning on the porch light so other people can see. As long as my room is lit, and I can read my magazine under the covers and, you know, you have your little halo. But then God said, you can't put the light under a bushel. It has to be seen. So stop trying to, to be scared to be a Christian and scared to be a believer. You need, the world needs to know that you trust God. The world needs to know you're a light. Okay, let me close this out real quick. Responding to the miraculous. This is on 244. After refocusing the disciples' attention on God's work, Jesus turned towards the blind man and miraculously opened his eyes. John called Jesus miracles signs because they pointed to Jesus' identity and his mission. This miracle clearly demonstrated who Jesus was and what he came to do. Those who saw the light shine that day responded in different ways. This sign revealed Jesus' identity and the conditions of their heart. This is what it's always about. Okay? It's always a heart thing. Always. Miracles took place. Jesus worked miracles. Some people believed. Some people didn't. Some people believed the miracle. Some people questioned. Some people connected it to sin. Some people connected it to the glory of God. What was it? A matter of the heart. I already know, Sister Tiffany, we can't save everybody. We can't. No matter how much we love folk, folk will still find fault. <laughs> you could love folk and love them and love them and love them and love them and they'll still find something wrong with the church. And see, you have to realize it's not you, it's them. See, now, if you're doing the right thing, now, I'm not talking about if you run some jack leg ministry. I'm talking about if you know you're a part of something right. And you love and you're doing everything you can do and they're still finding fault. That's not you. That's them. 
No matter what Jesus did, he healed the blind, they still find fault. He, he raised the dead, they still find fault. He fed the 5,000, they still find fault. It didn't matter what he did. What else could he do? What are you going to stone me for? What are you going to kill me for? Why are you smiting me? That's what he told them. What did I do? What have I done? Come on, church. So you have to know. We're praying that God will send us who is called to this body of believers. Send us as he did for me today. Send me and connect me to the people that's supposed to be a part of the body. And just let yourself go. So next time when, when, when God says, hey, go to Winn-Dixie instead of Publix, don't just say in your mind, oh, but Publix has all these coupons and all this stuff. See, something is at Winn-Dixie. Somebody is there that you're supposed to meet and talk to. You have to hear his voice. Thank you, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help See? Us. He'll tell you that. Don't stop at this gas station. Stop at this one. Oh, but I always get it there because special candies in this one now. It... <laughs> my, my, my favorite big gulp flavor is at this gas station. So I, that's why I always go. But if God says, if you feel this perception in you to go to this one, that's where you need to go. Because somebody's there waiting for you. Yes. You're the light. Yes. The perception. It's like what Sister Tiffany, uh, uh, when was that? Last Monday you talked about a uh, cowboy. See that? You don't know when cowboy will turn his life over to Jesus. Yes. All right. Amen. Ready, ready for you. See that? And nobody's outside of God's reach. When God gets ready, he'll use a donkey to talk to you. A burning bush. When God wants to get your attention, oh, he'll sober you up real quick. I am the Lord. I don't care how much you were drinking. Wait a minute. You're going to get sober real fast when God starts talking to you like that. When his presence comes, I'm calling you. And you're looking around. No, no, no. The I am the Lord thy God. Take off your shoes for where you're standing is holy ground. I cannot even imagine what was going through Moses' mind. To hear the audible voice of God. And give him an assignment. I am sending you back to Egypt. I've heard the cry of my people. Moses, like, I'm not going back to Egypt. <laughs> I'm, God, I'm good. Man, do you see the life I have here? Man, no problems, no war. I mean, I'm no drama. I'm good. I'm sending you back to Egypt. I've heard the cries of my people. Go and tell them, yeah. let my people go. Moses is like, ain't this about some stuff? <laughs> it's like, God, I know there's somebody else that can do this. You see, go get Bishop. Bishop will do it. You know, why can't Bishop do it? I know you talked to pastor. Let pastor do it. God said, no, Brother Sam, it's you. You're going to do it. And Moses kept telling him, I can't do this, God. I can't do it. I can't talk. I stutter. See, that's what we do, too. I stutter, Lord. I'm shy. I'm this. I can't do it. I can't. Oh, my God. I can't. Don't we do? Come on, tell the truth, y'all. Don't we do that? Don't we tell God everything we don't, we can't do? And God said, I made you. Yes, I should know what you can do. I know exactly what you can do and what you can't do. Yes. It's not about you. I will go with you. Yes. And then yes. Moses thought he was slick. I don't even know who to tell them sent me down here. 
You just tell them I am that I am has sent me. Okay, God. Okay. I will go with you. I will do miracles, signs, and wonders. I will deliver my what? You see the you see the terms? It's not your people, Moses. I will deliver my people. That's all you have to do, church. All you have to do is perceive that God is with you. If you have any situation you're dealing with in life this week or the rest of the year, perceive that God is with you. No matter what it is, no matter what's going on, perceive that God is with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you even to the end of the earth. He has you covered. No matter what it is, y'all, whether it's family, whether it's finance, whatever it is, perceive that the Lord is with you. Train your mind. I'm telling you, Quickly, when negative tries to come, train your mind. The Lord is with me. If, if that's all you can say, just say, the Lord is with me. That's why I said we're going to start doing, uh, what is this, Psalms 27, Michelle? We're going to start saying that because when you get into distress, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of who shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemy and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. No war shall rise up against me in this. See, once you say that, you're going to get fortified. You are going to know that God is with me. Thank you, Lord. See, that's what believers have to do. Hallelujah. Any crisis you get into, even if you just use that as a rule of thumb, yeah. just stop and just start quoting Psalm 27. Yeah. No matter what it is, if you're sitting in the doctor's office, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The doctor might be like, who are you talking to? Oh, I'm talking to God. See, you have to be bold. Yeah, yeah. Who you talk to? I'm talking to God. That's what I, it, this is not a game. I'm, yeah. I'm talking to yeah, God. Man. See that? I know who my father is, yeah. and I'm talking yeah. to him. Yeah. Yeah. Your blood pressure is up super high, and you're in there. Yeah. The Lord yeah. is my light. Yeah. Who shall I fear? Next thing you know, everything will start settling down because you're going to perceive that the Lord is with me, and everything is going to be all right. Let's all stand, saints. The Lord is with me. You're the light of the world. Be the light. Be the light. Act like the light. Talk like the light. Respond like the light. Move like the light. You're the light of the world. I'm telling you, church, I perceive that the Lord is with us. I can feel him. I perceive that he's with us. He's never left us. He's with us. Yes, amen. He's with us. Take somebody by the hand and we're going to pray. We perceive that God Almighty is with us. Lord. Even his name, Emmanuel. Yes, God. Emmanuel. Yes. God Lord. with Thank you. us. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name we give you praise and we give you glory. And Father, we truly do perceive that you are with us, God. We can feel you. We can feel your presence. We can sense you so near. As the song says, I feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is is in this place. I pray for every person tonight, God, under the sound of my voice, Lord Jesus Christ, that you will give them the divine fortitude to know that you have never left them and you will never forsake them. Whatever they're dealing with in life, God, the, the things that they will even face this week, 
Lord God, let them perceive that you are with them. Work it out, O oh God. Send the answers from heaven. Answer every question that they have. Make every crooked way straight, O oh God. Lord Jesus, we release answers into the atmosphere right now. We pray in Jesus' name and we stand on the word of God. Lord God, that things that need to be rectified will be. Things that need to be healed will be. Things that need to be broken will be. We will perceive that Emmanuel, the Lord God, is with us. You're with us always, God. You'll never leave us every moment of every day. Lord God, I pray for every person who is depressed. I pray for those who are downtrodden. I pray for those who seems in their life like they have no hope. Lord God, there is hope. We are shining our light into all the world. Lord God, last but not least, I pray for the city of Port Charlotte. I pray for Punta Gorda. I pray for every surrounding area, God. Lord, I pray that the light from the lighthouse will shine over this city and people will come to know you who is life eternal. They will know that there is power in the name of Jesus. There is change in the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There's joy in the name of Jesus. There's peace in the name of Jesus. There's love in the name of Jesus. Let the light shine even now as we pray and as we stand in a position of unity. Lord, we touch and agree for this city. We touch and agree for revival in this city. Let it break out like never before in men and women and boys and girls, red and yellow, black and white. They're all precious in your sight, oh God. Send them in, Lord Jesus Christ. Send them in. We're ready. Provide us, oh God, with the space. Provide us with the facility. Provide us with the land. Provide us with the finances. Provide us with the manpower. Provide us with everything that we need to carry out the divine mission that you have given unto us. We will not hide our light under a bushel. But we will let it shine. In the name of Jesus we pray. Let all God's people say. Amen. 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 Somebody clap your hands and give him praise. If you know God's with you. Give him praise. Hallelujah. I perceive. That the Lord is with you. He's with us. Emmanuel. God with us. Glory to the Lamb of God. Ooh, Jesus. God is so good. Wow, so many people with us online. Praise the name of the Lord. Emmanuel. God is with you. Amen. Praise God. So let's take up an offering tonight. Amen. This is a blessed people. It's a blessed church. Again, thank you so much for how you responded to the need yesterday again God was glorified in this place and I truly believe that God is going to continue to bless us financially in a very very powerful and exponential way that needs to be your prayer God use me let me be a conduit to bless others and when you pray that way God has no other choice but just to take you higher and higher and higher and higher in him. Amen. That's pray those prayers. And I promise you, these are promises I can make. God will bless you. He will open up the windows of heaven and he will pour out blessings that you don't even have room enough to receive and to contain. Amen. So as you're preparing those, thank you, Brother Michael. Brother Michael's going to come and he's going to collect that. Amen. Didn't he do a great job yesterday? Yeah. Opening up. Young man, I call upon you because you are strong. And I know God's going to bless him in a tremendous way. He started a new job this week as well. Amen. At a niche, 
a niche restaurant. Where is it in Fort Myers? In Fort Myers. So we're all gonna have to go down there. Amen. And support him in all of his endeavors and what he's doing. God is elevating him and pushing him forward. And we are glad about it. Amen. So to God be the glory. All the great things he has done. God bless you much this week. Um, remember, there's no YYA this week um, because we are on spring break. All the schools are out this week. Um, but we will have Bible study um, at 715 this week. Amen. So let's remember uh, future announcements. Of course, we have our Easter egg hunt that's coming up and all the things going on. Uh, with that on the 30th and on the 29th uh, Friday night good Friday night all roads are going to be leading here uh, for 730 so Friday March the 29th good Friday service right here um, at 730 p.m. amen so again get here early uh, there's going to be several churches that's going to be coming as we join together um, and we have a Holy Ghost time Amen. So God is going to work mighty miracles in this house. We Thank know God. that he is. Amen. So greet somebody in the name of the Lord. God bless you real good. Yes, and Dr. Zarita has brought some tasty sandwiches for everyone. Um, so make sure that you get some sandwiches and um, some chips and some goodies and take them with you. Amen. Be refreshed in the name of the Lord. God bless you real good. Have an amazing week.